My name is George Houston. I'm from Benedictine University in Illinois, United States. And um, it's just an honor to be here presenting. I'm standing right in front of the presentation. This is a project related to my dissertation, which um, is completed. So I'm nearly finished with the Benedictine uh, PhD program in the organization development. And uh, my mentors and leaders are here with us, uh, Peter Sorensen, Dr. Peter Sorensen, Dr. Teresa Yeager, um, Dr. Boji is also, and um, Grace Dr. Dr. Grace Ann is, has worked with our program before, so it's just, it's beautiful to be here, and it's, uh, thank you for this privilege. So my presentation today is the cost of indecision and how to use action research uh, for more effective decision making. I'm assuming an OD perspective which uh, brings in humanistic and democratic value based uh, forms of action research and self-managing teams that uh, originated with the socio-technical paradigm. Those are all assumptions in this work. Uh, my dissertation was titled Designing an Online Professional Learning Community in the New OD Era, and that meant that I worked with a virtual team of technologists and teachers as they created new digital technology. So this presentation explores the question, how can dialogic action research minimize costs through better management of virtual work team conversations? So as you know, uh, new OD, the new OD era refers to working with conversations and meaning making. And so this is the focus of this work. Uh, this work can be applied easily to the individual and team level, working with the dialogue on that level. Prior research on teams with differentiated subgroups tells us that when there are differences in these on the, on the left, uh, such as cognitive and emotional orientation or different knowledge bases, uh, this can result in problems or difficulties with uh, agreeing on the approach to prob problem solving, uh, difficulties with creating an integrated plan of action and decision making. So there is a need for an integrative agent. And in a sense then, what I've been doing in my, my work is, is integrating um, a differentiated subgroups on this work team. So a little bit of background on the project. It's, I'm calling it the LL Project. It was a $300,000 federal grant. And we were to develop a website and professional development curriculum for pre-service and teach and active teachers. And RF is the uh, primary client organization. It's a nonprofit that was owning the project. So this virtual core design team that I was working with, um, here's how the team was differentiated. It was comprised of uh, a vendor who was the director of marketing and technology. We had an independent contractor programmer uh, the executive director from RF was a high school teacher. Uh, his brother, twin brother, uh, was the program manager. They're both high school teachers. And then I filled the role of what started off as a virtual team facilitator. And then as I decided to use the project for my studies, I became more of a consultant and a PhD student in the study. So the deliverables and the budget for this work, uh, we were to create three systems, technology systems, and integrate them into an existing online professional learning community. The systems are quickly called the CIS, DSRS, PRS. Uh, through the grant, 30,000 was allocated to this project, this, these three, creating these technologies. We had 11 months to do it. And the results were that it actually took 24 months after the work started, and only one of the three systems was working. So this is not that um, uncharacteristic. 
Uh, so 11 months we worked before the due date and 13 months after the due date. Uh, looking down, these are modest numbers, uh, small projects, but the, in the 24 months that where we worked, the total cash was 45,000 paid, which was 50% over budget. When we look at the, uh, the phone conferences, uh, in the, the months before the due date, there were 19 conferences, 11 hours, and we were paying $100 an hour to the technology, the vendor, the rest of us were volunteering. So those costs were 1100 After the due date, there were 38 more teleconferences and 29 hours. So the total for the teleconferences, the cost was $4,000 for 57 calls. Uh, there was also an opportunity cost. And the plan was to teach, to put the new technologies in a graduate level course and sell it, the course. Uh, so that was deferred for 13 months, and based on the lost income, uh, there was 39,000 in revenues lost because of the delayed delivery of the technology. So the total for the costs were 84,000, which was over twice what was budgeted. So an example of dysfunctional decision making in our conversations. There were you know, all kinds of uh, examples of different things in the conversation. I chose one. Um, it happened when we were deciding whether to host the new CIS technology on the same server that existed or a different server. So what happened was the, uh, the programmer, the contractor, spent 30 hours working with this uh, on his own and then came back to a and so that 30 hours translated in $3,000 of costs, but he wasn't able to, do, to make it work. So when we were on the telephone the next time, after he spent this time working on it and the work failed, uh, we had what is a typical dysfunctional conversation. Uh, the marketing vendor and the programmer, they started disagreeing, and eventually they started using profanities and uh, sort of attacking each other. There was a little bit of history there that I won't go into, but it was, uh, it, it was brought to the surface, their conflict. Uh, the teachers were confused about what the technical decisions were. Um, I, the facilitator was pointing out uh, that on our responsibility chart, there was no clear designated person responsible for making this decision. And so we just said, okay, why don't the teachers, the executive directors, decide what to do? We're going to hang up and you decide. So they deferred that decision to the teachers. So along the way then, um, I started, since I was studying organization development, uh, thinking there must be some way to improve this dialogue and decision making. Naturally, I started thinking that way. And so, for this uh, presentation, the assumptions of dialogic action research are that it facilitates reflective dialogue and learning in the group, that it takes a guided change orientation, meaning uh, there's no one directing people what to do, uh, it's more self-managing, and there are less predetermined steps. So it's not mapped out, it's uh, decide as you go in a very collaborative way. Um, Number three, the, one of the, the main goals of dialogic action research is to create pragmatic knowledge for everyday practices. In this case, we wanted to improve decision making. And then number four, dialogic action research is uh, scientists uh, translating a theory for the practitioner. So what we learned was that teachers were unaware of how their stream of ideas were affecting the technologists' work. The technologists were unaware of the importance, the shifting priorities of teachers, and everybody was, there was a raised awareness of why things weren't getting done. Uh, part of the reflective conversation had the um, technologists telling the programmer, the teachers, uh, we were building boats, and then you asked us to build cars. Then you say, we should have a coffee maker in our car. 
so you asked us to build coffee makers in cars. Uh, you were the brain telling muscles to do things they cannot do. These were some of the metaphors that came out of the reflective conversations. So what we did was uh, we, through the reflection, the learnings and the actionable learnings were we, instead of being so stream of consciousness, we began um, clarifying our decisions that were in progress. And the uh, technologists revealed a ranking system that they used internally, and it was so helpful that we could all use finally the same ranking system. So very modest uh, but helpful ac new actions. So then I'll finish by sharing two tools from, uh, that are also helpful in managing these conversations. One is uh, the group theory which, uh, from the 70s, which uh, talks about epigenetic leadership and the mobility of decision making, meaning that through the life cycle of a work group, uh, based on the different activities and needs of the group, leadership will shift around the group. So different leaders will emerge at different times. Uh, this could have been used when, with the one server versus two. We should have had the programmer decide, given him leadership, uh, rights and maybe he would not have spent those 30 hours, wasted those 30 hours. Uh, we wouldn't have had that dysfunctional conversation and the opportunity cost would have been diminished. Uh, next tool is the room and yet decision making style model and there are five uh, types of decision making. This model helps a leader decide which type is, fits the situation better. So it starts with authoritarian, where the leader makes a decision him or herself. Uh, and then A2 gathers information, makes a decision him or herself. Uh, moving to collaborative on the continuum, uh, the uh, leader starts talking to stakeholders uh, individually in C1 and uses their input. C2, the leader starts talking to the group rather than individuals and uses the group's input. Uh, group two is uh, where the group generates the alternative solutions. And it's a consensus making process which involves everyone and the leader is a facilitator of the consensus decision. So with the model, there are different diagnostic questions um, such as uh, does the leader have sufficient information to make a decision in an authoritarian way? Um, and then is acceptance of the decision by stakeholders critical? So by answering these questions, uh, this can be flow charted onto, uh, which would lead one to a decision making style. So in applying this, um, if had this model or a similar model been used in the project before, we could have avoided uh, some of the personnel costs because frankly the, there were too many uh, collaborative G2 conversations happening uh, that were not necessary. So, uh, and this caused a flow of excessive mistimed ideas which uh, caused iteration confusion. The technologists did not know what the teachers wanted. The iteration was confused. So, you know, we could, the, the leader, uh, working with the leader to use the model uh, so that more one-on-one -on -one conversations are used as required versus group teleconferences. Um, and the leader can know when to assume authoritarian or a group consensus style. And then by leveraging these tools, um, we can see that dialogic action research is helping to manage conversations better and this will lower personnel costs by avoiding unneeded teleconferences, um, minimizing the opportunity cost, and lowering the overall costs. This is uh, a, a framework that came from the, my dissertation, which uh, takes a snapshot of some of the complexity of the different voices that go into the conversation stage. It's uh, social and technical dimensions. Uh, taking into account a larger external environment, members of the online professional learning community, core design team, and all of these voices, some of which are in, not human voices, but are technology um, material voices, go into the conversation stage. And this, uh, what happens in here, I call
called the Discern Democracy Perspective. Yeah, you cited Maurer and Githen's uh, work, on, and they have this idea of the uh, mutual learning that comes from a pragmatic dialogue. Um, how did what you do create a pragmatism? Uh, they say there's certain blockages to critical pragmatic action in the dialogue. So how did these people resolve their, they were yelling at each other, they were using profanity. How did this get resolved? Um, what, what's the pragmatic action? Well, that, for that particular case, that instance where they were both becoming more frustrated, um, it was resolved by, uh, I said, um, well, you're both, you both have the same frustrations uh, with the work not being resolved. Um, so I was, I, I, I'm not sure if I'm answering it from the right angle, but I tried to put them on a common understanding that it wasn't, they were not against each other, that they were in the same, uh, sharing the same frustration. And, and then one of the teachers said, yes, and we're not getting our technology system created. So he brought it back to, uh, I tried to ease the tension. Um, but I think that bringing in the decision-making style model could have uh, preempted, I think we would avert some of the barriers to working together. Uh, so for, for that example, I don't think that the marketing person should have been in the conversation about one server or two servers. So we would have avoided that, creating that conversation. And so practically we would have avoided creating that, um, the butting of the heads from the, the pragmatic problem of those two talking. They should not have been talking about that, I think. I've, I've, uh, my experience of working with action research and with this, frustration is necessary for moving to development. Frustration is necessary for moving to W. Okay. Yes. Agreed. Agreed. So, uh, at least you, know, you talked about dissolving the tension. I yes. live as a facilitator aggregating the tension. Mm -hmm. the, the tension, I agree, is necessary for learning and uh, double loop learning. Um, it's, I think there, there is a, a gradation of where the tension becomes unproductive. So the problem is would be defining the gradation, at what point does it become unproductive and should be averted. So a related question is that since you use social technique analysis, the dependencies and the nature of dependencies between the, uh, the teacher group and the programmer group, uh, your diagnosis did not talk about the nature of task dependencies. Of the dependencies between the two groups? The, between the two, the teacher group and the mm -hmm. uh, the programming and technology group. Right. Within right. this within this group. There was, a, there was a kind of dependency which existed, which was almost reciprocal dependencies. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, well, I, I took a... Uh, I didn't try to diagnose too much. I don't know if this is answering your question uh, that well, but uh, my angle was not to diagnose the group so much, but just start with the sort of ontology, if you will, of these differentiated uh, tacit knowledge bases and how they sometimes um, are just not understanding where the other is coming from. So I think what you're saying was not quite in the scope of how I yeah, we're talking about the technical aspect. You talked about the social aspect, but the technical aspect, which mm -hmm. talks about the nature of dependencies. Mm -hmm. Okay. This might relate to your comment. I found it um, very interesting and, and frustrating, you know, to go through that kind of process, I imagine. And it's similar to when I was doing my filmmaking, the working with different groups of people. It seems that what you have 
the comments that the brain is telling the muscles to do things that it can't, mm -hmm. that um, in order to have participation, different professional orientation people have to be educated in how to make their input in a way that's more functional. So there's work, what I discovered was there's a lot of pre-work that needs to be done before we get together to discuss. Right, right, right. And both sides need to be more educated about the capabilities and the kind of input that's understandable on the other end. Yes, yes. And the dependency is, uh, I think the epigenetic leadership is getting at that dependency of what you're talking about. That um, someone should know at what point does leadership decision shift to a technologist out of necessity because the rest of us are dependent on their knowledge base. So we trust them, we give them the decision making. And um, there was one fellow, Whistler, from I think the 60s. He was also um, working with insurance companies where they were bringing IT into the insurance company. And he discovered this, uh, you know, that although they were dependent, they were also wanted to run from each other when they saw each other. And so he created the integrative agent, uh, the county agent, I think he called it. Uh, one person who was well versed in both camps and tried to, um, uh, you know, nurture the, the dependents and rather than let it be so di divisive. What was the name of that researcher again? Whistler? I think it's W-H-I-S-L-E-R. In the 60s or 70s. Maybe it's the 60s. The My clarification was conference calls or video conference calls or? Um, audio, just teleconference, yes. Just teleconference, yes. Not, yep. No video conference. Right, right. Yep, that's right. But that would have made a difference. That would have made a difference, I'll bet. It was brought up in the reflective conversations. Uh, that we were doing visual work, and so why aren't we looking at something together? That was, would have made a big difference, yes. Yeah. But I found the same dynamics, working face-to-face -face with people, because you're, you're going into new territory, they want to be able to do what you're asking, but then they come to realize it's not possible, and the request is not feasible, and, mm -hmm. and so both sides, even face-to-face, are promising things they can't deliver on, and then getting frustrated, and then getting blamed. Well, you said this. Yes. It's and the, I think that's a good example of the hidden cost. Of yeah. Why are we this? There are so many costs with uh, <coughs> neglecting the visual part. So uh, that fits very well with yeah. I think hidden costs. Mm -hmm. And I, I I like very much your uh, and the, well economic analysis of the yeah. of the project. It, it, it might be more comprehensive in terms of the, what we call the, the intangible investment in the project and the impacts. Not only short-term impacts, but also long-term. Mm -hmm. And uh, what you mentioned is, uh, for instance, the, the video conference might be, well, more costly in terms of visible cost, mm -hmm. but not uh, creating the community is a huge cost because of, of investment in earnings, opportunity costs, and so on. And this might be, and even, in, well, according to our education suites, uh, in, in those virtual projects, um, virtual teams, uh, it makes sense organizing uh, a meeting face to face, even if it, even though it might be much more costly because of the lights right. and so on, yes. because not doing so is uh, uh, right. results in. Uh, not creating a community, not sharing yes. uh, the same language, the same, uh, and they are, uh, in a way, uh, unaddressed issues. In that. So we need a, a mirror effect up front, mm -hmm. right. and face to face. Yes, yes. That brings me to the cost was my concern, and that I love the paper was the cost of indecision. Mm -hmm. If you ever come up, I mean, it, it looked terribly costly, I think, was the, was the lesson learned. It, 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 is, it looks like that cost of indecision was, I mean, in the, in the SEMA approach, you'd actually put a, a, a financial number on that. Yeah. And, and you started out with just a $33,000 grant, and the cost of this whole project ran so far over, so that indicates cost of indecision. Right. Do you know that number? Did anyone ever, in, in the SEMA 
approach someone would have would have uh, would have contrived that number. Right, right. Uh, you know, I would like to do it using the same approach. I think uh, it's still I could still do that. I would like to do that. Yes. Thank you. Yes. That is where I think seem is uh, enlightening in when looking at a situation like this. Of mm -hmm. here is a way of analyzing for hidden costs. There are so obviously so many hidden costs in this project, which uh, your ideas have brought to light some of these hidden costs and 